Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Mercifully short. <laughs> Churchill uh, apparently hated long introductions. And he was in America once, and he was to speak at what the Americans call the commencement address at Yale University. Uh, and the president of Yale took forever to introduce him. And he took the four letters Yale as the backbone of his speech. So Y stood for, and off he went for about 10 minutes. And A stood for, and another six or seven minutes. And L stood for five or f f six minutes. And E was for, and it didn't seem it was ever going to come to an end. And Churchill eventually got to the microphone and he looked over his glasses at the assembled multitude and he said, we can all be very thankful that we are not in the hall of the Massachusetts <laughs> Institute for Technology. <laughs> it's a great privilege to be with you this morning. It's a real joy, actually. I've been looking forward to it. Not least of all because uh, I always enjoy meeting real Australian men. Uh, but also because I love talking about machinery. And when I heard that Roy had set this up as uh, a, a thing called Men and Machines, I thought, well, this has got to be interesting. So I thought I'd um, just uh, sort of trace through some of my life story by referring to some of the machines that I've been able to tinker with and have owned and have stripped down and restored and used on a farm. Because you'll understand that being a former politician, I'm not very bright, <laughs> but the one thing that I got brilliantly right was choosing my parents. <laughs> they were Australian, and this is the best country in the world to live in, for a start. Yay! And secondly, my father was a farmer. Uh, I'm sixth generation in northwest New South Wales, and genetically I seem to be hotwired to love playing with machinery. In fact, I'm a frustrated automotive engineer. That was a thing I always wanted to do. But I was sitting down here uh, talking to Joe, who's been a maths teacher. I didn't want to fess up. The reason I couldn't do automotive engineering was my maths was too weak. <laughs> Because I didn't go into a classroom until I was about nine. We were you know, fairly isolated where we lived, so for the first few years it was correspondence school. Uh, but anyway, my very earliest memory is of Armistice Day in 1959. Why do I remember that? Because it was the day that my father and mother put me and my little sister in the old Perzo 203 station wagon and we drove into Gunnedah to pick up the new ute. Now that's actually only a toy, that one, but that's what it was. It was a early series two Land Rover. And we had black soil uh, roads at home. We now, they're a bit more sophisticated, sealed now. But my mother actually at that stage was very ill. In fact, she died only months later. And my father was worried that in those wet summers we get at home, uh, if she got ill, we wouldn't be able to get out. And his old World War II army jeep, the four-wheel drive, was worn out. So we bought a Land Rover. And I learned to drive on it, in it, on it, in it. Uh, and believe it or not, if we've got the next slide, I still have it. There you go. My son looks at that and says, oh, Dad, these damn things, they, they breed. <laughs> when I was, uh, uh, it, for some reason, it never left the place. It's the one on the left, as a matter of fact, sort of partly obscured. Uh, and it's been completely and totally restored. It was a tray back. When I did it up, I put a well back on it. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd learnt to drive in it. And we're not one of those farms where old machinery lies around. But for some reason, this one was never sold. It always stayed on the place. So I taught my kids to drive in it. And then my son and I were out spotlighting with one of his mates and his father one night. And we cracked the head on it. And I thought, oh, it's time for the gully or the wreckers. And I thought, no, I won't. Because John Howard used to play golf to take his mind off things on Sunday afternoon. And I thought, I'm going to tear this thing down, see if I can rebuild it. Uh, to take my mind off things. So it took three years to dismantle it because I could never find time, but I did. Uh, and then uh, two years putting it back together again. And of course it's better now than factory original. And, and if any of you know anything about Land Rovers, you'll say, well, that wouldn't be hard. <laughs> 
but there it is. So having sort of learnt to drive in that, I moved on to my first truck. There you go. Now that isn't it, I have to tell you. Many of you, because you're men and machines, and I've seen the pictures of uh, what you used to do around the place, uh, uh, you know, and the, the events you've held, will recognise those cabs. They're very popular, those are in ute form, aren't they? Um, but the one we had was a Chevrolet 1500, 1953, uh, and it was legal for five tonnes, but it never had less than about 10 tonnes of wheat on it. <laughs> and they had an old, what they called a stovepipe six-cylinder motor, uh, which was an interesting engine developed towards the end of the 1930s. And during the American occupation of Japan after the war, trying to help the Japanese rebuild their economy, the American government arranged for the blueprints for those so-called stovepipe motors to be given to Toyota. And they developed the motor being Japanese to the point where they used to last forever. And for many, many years, they powered Toyota Land Cruisers, originally in the troop carriers. Uh, and then I think they ran right up until the 80s, as a matter of fact. Uh, but all I can remember is that with 10 tonnes of wheat on the back, you really had to learn very, very quickly indeed because it was uh, more than that little old six-cylinder and the four-speed, and they had a split diff, and you operated it was down on the dashboard. You had to really learn how to manage these things, and they had a rev range of about 500 from memory, about 500 to 1,000, and it was redlining. So they took a bit of mastering. So those were my sort of early days of uh, playing around with machinery. I could have put endless other photos up, uh, little TEA 20 Fergusons and Fordson Super Majors, uh, things like that. Uh, but having uh, mastered the art of driving a Chevrolet 1500 and so on, I was sent off to Sydney to boarding school because we lived in a pretty isolated area. And I wasn't going to tell this part of the story this morning uh, until uh, uh, talking to my introducer this morning down the back and he told me that he'd been watching a program on SBS uh, about uh, what happened to me when I was about 13 or 14 and I thought I will tell it this morning. And I'll tell you why I'm going to tell you. This is a hard story for me to tell and it won't be easy for you to listen to. But it's because, how, how many of you have watched or heard of Jordan Peterson? Many of you? Now, here's an ad, all right? Roy didn't know I was going to put an ad in here. I have a website called johnanderson.net.au, and I've interviewed him now three times. And I'm fascinated by Jordan Peterson. And I'll tell you why I'm fascinated. I was asked to compare a night when he spoke at Chatswood about 15 months ago in Sydney. And I was told it was a sellout, and it was. I got there, and I'd hardly heard of this Canadian clinical psychologist. And I'm standing up the front. There's a 1,000 people. There's not a spare seat. And Jordan Peterson walks on and they give him a standing ovation. He's not a rock star. He's not a musician. He's not some sort of um, celluloid hero. He's a clinical psychologist who's taken on the politically correct world in Canada and become a sensation. And then I look at the audience and half of them are men under 30. They're young Australian men. And I think, why are they here? He speaks for 90 minutes. They give him another standing ovation. He comes back and takes questions for 30 minutes, they give him a third standing ovation. Why are young Australian men attached, are so attracted? Why do they want to come and listen to him? What's his message? It's a tough one. He said things like, you know you're not the person you ought to be. Well, there's a whole bunch of people who've given him a standing ovation for being insulting. <laughs> The more you look at yourself, the more terrible you'll realise that in truth you are. And you're not the person that you want to be and you know that you ought to be. And you'll be saying, how can I fix up this mess? And he said, don't think an empathy culture can do it for you. What's an empathy culture? That's a culture now that we live in where the greatest crime our children can commit is to offend somebody. Have you noticed that? But if you do disagree with somebody who shouldn't be offended, you can be hated. It's a strange thing, isn't it? That's how social media does it. Now, have you seen the way kids talk to themselves now on social media? It's tearing us apart. 
And they're soaking up this message. He's saying things like, don't think the political processes can save you. Redemption will not be through the political process. It will be at the level of the individual, one by one. So you know you're not who you ought to be. Go back to your bedroom. Make your bed, which is code for get yourself sorted out. And then go back out in the world and try and make a positive difference. They're not bad messages. But I was intrigued by this. And then I thought to myself, he's been utterly honest with them. His honesty was incredible, including about his own failings and views. And I thought, if there's one thing young Australian men now are really looking for, it's authenticity. My son's 29. I'm very proud of him. He's a regular Australian bloke. The best in the tradition of Australian blokes. But he would say, I don't want coloured water posing as milk. I want a steak, if you know what I mean. Our culture is selling us short on what it is to be real. And just after that, SBS came along. And because I've been in the public arena, people know a little bit about my story, and they wanted me to go on a program called Innocent Deaths. You know how the SBS on Insights, they have those panels and they get people talking about things that are really tough? And I said, no, I wouldn't do it, but I'd tell my story for one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and my introducer this morning uh, was telling me down the back that he'd just been watching it. And I said, well, it was only half the story. They edited out the Christian part of it. He said, well, it still came through. But the reason I mention it is that at the age of 14, my father was a very gifted sportsman, much more so than I was. So every afternoon on the farm, we'd go off for target shooting, popping bunnies off on the, down along the creek before the myxomatosis and so forth, cleaned them all up. We don't have a rabbit problem anymore. It's incredible what the CSIRO has done for us. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, or it'd be boxing or cricket, which was the other great passion of the old man. And, Easter time, 1970, it's a long time ago. That's my grey hair, I'm 62. Uh, so I was about 14 at the time. We are practising cricket, and as I say, the old man was a brilliant sportsman. I was slower to catch on. Suddenly I found the sweet spot, and I was belting him all over the place. And he's having trouble holding back the grin. The boy's finally got it. He's hit the sweet spot, he's away. You know that moment? You've probably all experienced it. And if you're like me, you probably watch your kids and there's suddenly something they've been trying to get and it comes to them. Anyway, I, I belted a ball for six, so to speak, and my younger sister, who was down the other end of the lawn, a long way away, really, she was playing with a little cat and she looked up. She was just being with Dad and her brother and not engaged in the game and she saw a ball coming for her and she instinctively turned away and it caught her in the back of the neck and she staggered to her feet to move towards Dad and died. So my innocence, my childhood ended at that point. And I went back to school and I have to say my family were very brave and courageous and stood with me and my mates were good to me and the staff were good to me, but I'd gone to a place of deep loneliness where my childhood was over and I needed answers. And I was at a school where by accident, I think, they'd employed a young Christian pastor, because you always had a chaplain at that school, it was an Anglican school, but, but this one believed the Bible and taught it. And boys everywhere were being converted. And one day, in the midst of me trying to find answers after what had happened, he started to talk in the service in the morning about an intimate relationship with a God who personally loves you and who can be loved in return. Now, I'd always believed there was a God, but I was actually very angry with the idea that it could be personal. That was far too challenging. These days, I'd be saying, that's offensive. You shouldn't be saying that to me without a trigger warning in case I need to go to a safe space <laughs> and cuddle some soft toys or pat the dog. <laughs> See, we try to insulate people from reality, don't we? And in our universities now, we won't challenge them, but we all need challenging, and I needed challenging. 
And I was pretty distraught by this, and I didn't want to go and talk to the chaplain. But at my commerce teacher, I thought, now this, he's one of these God botherers, and I need to know what this is about. So he's uh, a bit of a bloke, but he's old and wise and experienced as well. I did the maths the other day, he was 27. <laughs> uh, but anyway, off I went to talk to him, and he led me to faith. I became a believer. My father was dismayed, said I'd never have any friends again. So thank you for being a couple of hundred good mates for breakfast this morning. <laughs> if I could, I'd go and say, Dad, I'm not completely without friends. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of you will know those objections yourself. It's not easy in the Australian cultural context to put your paw up and say, I've become a Christian believer. I, <laughs> some of my mates still say things like, you believe in someone walking on water? I say, mate, that's only the beginning of it. I believe in a physical resurrection. And I do. Somebody said to me the other day, bright people don't believe that anymore. And I stopped and I thought, how am I going to answer that? And I answered it honestly. I said, the three most intelligent and smartest Australian men I know all believe in the physical resurrection, resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not a question of intelligence. It's a question of thinking it through carefully and looking at the evidence. Anyway, I progressed through school and I got distracted and started to drift away. And my father, in an act of great generosity, and just as I was about to leave school, he said, OK, I'm giving you half my ute now. And if you get into university, you can have the other half. Can we have it up? He didn't split it in the middle. He wasn't like Solomon, but that's what it was. <laughs> so there you go. See, the Curral were blue, it was called. Holden HR Utility, made in 1966. Uh, and it was heavily optioned. It had mud flaps and a cigarette lighter and a sun visor. <laughs> Some of you remember them. They've come a long way, haven't they? And actually, when you think about it, they were pretty lethal because, uh, particularly the utes, they were very tail happy. They were also heavy understeers, so you never knew what was going to get let go first. And I can assure you, I set out to find out. <laughs> I did a lot of very silly things in that car, and I'm thankful I'm still alive. I span it out on ice, black ice, at Lithgow once. And that was a pretty terrifying experience. How? It must have been an absolute miracle because there was a big truck, semi, coming the other way. I must have nearly got under it. And I remember of, um, the vision somewhere as a car span of a, one of those old white timber guideposts. I don't think they use them anymore, but I remember seeing it flip up in the air. I'm thinking, oh, we've hit something. It heard the crunch. And I got out of the car and walked around it. There's no damage at all until I got back to the driver's door. And it had been sort of shoved right in, smashed up beyond recognition. But it was a very fortunate moment. Anyway, it took me all over the place. And that was the problem. You know, you go to university and uh, you're having a good time. And I started to walk away a bit from my faith, to be honest. There's a second photograph of this, by the way, just to remind you of how simple and primitive they were. <laughs> I say to my kids, stop complaining. In my day, it was a vinyl bench seat. It didn't even have a heater, let alone an air conditioner. <laughs> now, there's a little challenge in this. Has anybody noted the inconsistency? Right, yeah. Now, mine had a radio. That one hasn't, has it? Yeah. Oh, it has. Yeah, no, mine only had a radio because I put one in it. Dad didn't have it when he gave it to me. Keith, what's the inconsistency? Have you noticed? That is not the inside of a Currawa Blue Holden utility because they didn't have specials. That was the deluxe model. <laughs> <laughs> two-tone blue vinyl upholstery <laughs> and two-tone door cards. There you go. <laughs> anyway. Uh, and it was only in my last year at university I was studying late modern European history. And you say, well, what's that? And what relevance has that got? Well, as we studied the great ideas, the great clash of ideas that shape people and the societies they live in, I started to realise that this wonderful country that we live in, that is a Western country, largely derived from England, if you like, 
the mother of parliaments, our legal system, our education system, uh, the idea of the welfare system, etc. So well, we'd basically inherited it from Britain and it was wonderful. And compared to, as Churchill said, democracy is a terrible form of government till you consider the alternatives. And I thought to myself, how blessed are we? Where does it come from? And I started to understand that the West was built on the Christian, Bob Menzies used to say this, on the Christian conception that we're not all the same. Some of us have more ability and more talents and a higher station in life and some of us are not so fortunate. But, but, a higher authority said every one of us matters. In his eyes, we have equal value. So I can't hate my neighbour because a higher authority said, no, that person's worthy of respect and dignity because he has my stamp on them. It made in my image. And that lies at the heart of our freedoms. It lies at the heart of the idea that power should be obtained not at the point of a gun oppressing others, but at the point of a pencil. And because we're corruptible, I mean, that's the problem with politicians. I don't know whether this has ever occurred to you. You know what the problem with politicians is? They're human beings. And when they get proud and when they get lazy and when you want to change them, in democracy, you don't have to shoot them. You use that pencil. I've got to say to you, I think many of you must have used it very wisely a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> um, you don't know what I mean by that. <laughs> you don't think I'm biased, do you? <laughs> and compared to the alternatives, and then something else struck me. I looked at all the attempts. Even when we've got these good things, we're never satisfied, are we? So you had uh, all these attempts to get away from the sort of Christian-based democracy that had slowly evolved in our culture. On the left wing, you had communism. On the right wing, you had fascism, which developed into Nazism. I thought, I can't go there. They're horrific. I want to go back. And our lecturer, who wasn't a Christian at Sydney University, he'd probably get the sack for it now, well, at the end of the course, just before we did our exams, and he'd been to Vietnam, he'd lost an arm and he always wore short-sleeved shirts. It was very disconcerting because he used to gesticulate <laughs> quite a bit. And, uh, but he said, now listen, he said, this isn't in the curriculum, but he said, I hope you realise where we've got to. We're at a fork in the road if you stop and think about where you're at. You've seen where we've come from and you've seen how keen people are to get away from it. Are you going to re-embrace the traditional Christian roots of our society or are you going to try and look for another ism? And he said, I struggle with this every year. And then I thought, that's a proxy for me. I actually know what the truth is. I want to go and do it my way. But it's never worked. And I very reluctantly went back to the faith that I'd found at school. Anyway, I went home. I started farming. I was persuaded, literally, it wasn't something I set out to look for, to have a go at the federal parliament. And I ended up there, and I ended up, as you know, in office. It was a great privilege, a great honour. I didn't become addicted to it, and I'm thankful for that. I did what I thought I could, to my absolute amazement, and you know, they say behind every every man. In my case, it was an astonished mother-in-law. I became Deputy Prime Minister at the age of 42, which was the second youngest. 41 was the youngest. Served in that role for six years, and then I thought, by the grace of God, I've done enough. Uh, I'm, I'm quitting. I'm going home. Uh, and so I did so. By then, farming had changed. And I think I've got another photograph there of what started to emerge. Oh no, that was... Now this is put up there because I'm a Holden man and there's always an exception that proves the... <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> uh, the exception that proved the rule. I've always loved cars. I've always loved pulling them down, playing with them, and I've always loved driving them. Uh, and I've always had Holdens. And then I was persuaded to try a Falcon and I bought a G6E Turbo not long after I left the parliament. Some of you might remember them. And it was a magnificent motor car, except that every time I went somewhere, something went wrong with it. <laughs> it was unbelievably quick. It was smooth. It had the best seats of any car I think I've ever been in. 
but there was always something wrong with it. So I actually only had it for a couple of years. But that was an interlude. Farming, I found, had changed. So we've got the next one. Now, I put this up just to show you. It's a little bit of a contrast with things like the old uh, Fordson Super Major. Uh, that's not actually our farm, although just about uh, we do have a header just like that, a tractor just like that, and a pickup bin just like that. And I've got to tell you, it's changed. You know, the days of shivering in the winter and cooking in the summer on a Fordson Super Major, and then we went to a Ford 5000. That's all long gone. That cabin is the quietest place you could ever hope to be. And it's got the most powerful air conditioning you could ever imagine and the best stereo you could possibly find. And my son enjoys it. <laughs> because I am restricted to the old gear on the place. Have we got the next one? There you go. <laughs> that's me, OK? Now, that's not actually mine either, but it's very, very similar. Uh, a a, a mid-60s international huff loader. And yes, we do have one. And yes, it's still in pretty constant use. Uh, and we use it for everything from pushing up uh, dead trees to a lot of trees on, on a big farm. Uh, and uh, moving soil and repairing contour banks and all of those sorts of things. And just to, you know, this is me showing off, all right? Forget the fact that I might have once been a public figure. I know how to do an in-chassis engine rebuild on one of those because it was burning a litre of oil an hour. <laughs> and I thought it must be leaking somewhere. We went, uh, <laughs> but it wasn't. It was just burning it. And uh, even though it's ancient, a bloke from down this way has got a, 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 still gets parts for them and he got me $2,000. That's all it was. You know, massive, big inline six-cylinder. $2,000 for a Czechoslovakian made engine kit, beautifully engineered. So we pulled the head off and we pulled the fuel tank off, a massive great big fuel tank under the engine at the back and uh, did an in-house, in pulled the liners out. I got six, four of them came out easily, two of them wouldn't. And I thought, how do you do this? And I talked to an engine rebuilder and he said, you get an old stick welder and you weld down the, is this right Roy? Down inside the liners with your stick welder, and as it cools, it shrinks them, and then they'll come out. And we put it all back together, and away it went. I couldn't believe it. It actually started, and it went, and it's kept going. Anyway, that's uh, what I do now in my spare time. My son runs the place with his wife, uh, and I'm very, very proud of them. Even in a terrible drought, they're doing a brilliant job. And I'm the gopher. I go for this, and I go for that. Now, machinery can be embarrassing at times. My final slide. That isn't quite the one involved, uh, but um, it's uh, meant to be a, a candy red Harley Davidson. What do I mean by embarrassing? Well, I was acting Prime Minister at the time when we realised how terrible the tsunami was in Indonesia in 04. Do you remember that? One of the interesting things about being Deputy PM is that quite frequently you'd be acting PM. So I, I had the reins at the time of 9-11. That was pretty nerve-wracking. I remember getting down on my hands and knees saying, Lord, well, we don't know how serious this is, but I have to put all self-interest aside here. If I miss something, Australians may die, because we assumed there'd be a series of rolling attacks. And it was assumed that other Western countries would be attacked. We now know that was meant to happen, but they couldn't train enough pilots quickly enough after 9-11. That John Howard was at the time, he was in Washington. He was only a mile from where the plane went into the Pentagon. And I can tell you, uh, it was one of those moments when I would have liked to have done what that Italian uh, cruise ship captain did, you know, jump off the bridge at the critical moment and swim away, but it kind of wasn't an option. You know, I was there and I had to trust God to see me through and I assumed it would be the end of the government. I certainly assumed it would result in massive economic damage. You know, there was a run on the share markets. In some ways, history may record that it was the beginning of a very, very serious decline for the West because it was when the Americans particularly started to make credit so easily available that people started to borrow irresponsibly, and that led to the great financial crash of 10 years ago. They were so worried about the breaking of confidence by 9-11. And that debt crisis has only been resolved by more debt. We need to be aware that the world is in a precarious financial position. Anyway, um, one of the other times that I was in the chair, 
John Howard used to say to me, uh, I'm going here or I'm having my break or whatever, I'll leave the keys on the desk, I'll get them when I'm back. <laughs> anyway, I'd bet something like this on my security detail, because when he was out of the country, even in this peaceful country, I used to have to have the planes close policemen. You know, those, uh, and they were all terrific people, wonderful people. You could always pick them, of course they had little curly wire, and they, most of them had a bit of presence. Although there were two absolutely beautiful girls on the team, and they were the most lethal of all. They looked like butter wouldn't melt in their mouth, but they were all trained in martial arts and what have you. So, but I'd bet something like this, and there'd be two or three of them placed in the audience, they'd get up and quietly wander out, and I'd just think to myself, right, well, the boss is back, his wheels have touched down on the tarmac, and someone can shoot me now. It's all right. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, uh, back to the story, uh, Indonesia, we realised how serious it was and uh, uh, we were talking on the phone, John Howard was on holidays at Kirribilli House, he was about to go to the cricket, and this thing is much more serious, we've had Timor break in the relationship and it's a humanitarian disaster, we need to do a great act of solidarity and we decided on the billion dollars, you probably remember that? And it did wonders for our relationship with Indonesia. And remember how important Indonesia is. It's the fourth most populous nation on earth. It's the biggest Muslim nation on earth, although there's 35 million Christians in Indonesia. People forget that. There's 100 Bible colleges in Indonesia. It's not all Muslim, but it's very, very important to us. And relationships have always been strained, but one of the things that really helped was that we were there after that tsunami. To cut a long story short though, that got me involved a bit in Indonesia and I used to go, I don't go up so much now, but I got involved with some of the rebuilding and some of the people who were doing it. And eventually I uh, got talking, we were trying to do some more work in the medical area uh, with a very senior businessman in Jakarta. And one day he said to me, uh, we're both Christians, will you come and talk at my church? And I thought, oh, you know, I wonder what it's going to be like in Muslim Indonesia talking in a church. I said, uh, stalling for time, I said, have you asked your head pastor? He looked at me and said, I am the head pastor. <laughs> and I, realising I was snookered, I said, well, look, I'd love to. So up I go, and this church turns out to be quite amazing, I have to tell you. It's in the, out towards Karawachi, the west of Jakarta. Uh, and on the Saturday morning, just like this, morning just like this, he said, let's go along, we'll show you where you're going to be talking tomorrow. So as you do, we got in the helicopter and we went to the church and landed the helicopter and I was amazed. A great big purpose-built place and there were going to be two services of 3,000 each that I was to talk to. But the Ulysses Club, they had one. Harley's was there on the Saturday morning. They were all having breakfast, just like we might do. It was good fun. And one of them said, can you ride a motorbike? And I said, oh, I can ride a motorbike. <laughs> I've never had a bike uh, license, but you know, on a farm, you ride a bike all over the place. It's quite a big foyard, uh, courtyard there. So I said, oh, show us. So I said, well, which one will I get on? This one. And it was a candy red Harley. So I did a couple of circuits around the helicopter and parked it, rode back in again. And there's all these Indonesians with their cameras and their, their, their smartphones, click, 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 click. They're all laughing their heads off. And I thought, what's so funny? So I parked the Harley and the owner, who's a very attractive young lady, came over to me and she's laughing too. And I said, I've obviously done something very funny. What is it? She said, well, I don't know about in your culture, but in this one, you need to clearly understand that a candy red Harley is a lady's Harley. <laughs> And we have you on camera. <laughs> anyway, so when we'd all had a good laugh and a bit of breakfast, we went into this massive, great big new church. It was huge. And being in the country that it's in, you've got to go through the metal detectors and what have you because security's tight. And we walk into this vast auditorium and there's a screen down the front. Now, it's a real screen. I don't mean any offence about these screens, but this one was 40 metres long by four metres high. It was huge, purpose made in China for that church. And I have to tell you that on one side it had their logo, which from memory was Christ Church, the perfect church for imperfect people. And then it had a picture of me, uh, which was taken from the cover of a book. I can see one down there, I've just signed it, um, in a pink shirt. I've never lived it down. Um, 
Anyway, it's up there. And I still had black hair when that was taken about 10 years ago. And there's an Indonesian fellow who comes up to me. So this is about three years ago, I suppose. And he looks at the photo on the screen. He looks at me. And then he says, just how long ago was that photo taken? <laughs> but I'm more interested in what's on the remainder of the screen, which must have been about 25 metres. This is huge, this thing, by four metres. And it had up the top, in small writing, we welcome our guest. And I thought, that's nice. And then it had, I felt pretty important, my name in the biggest letters I've ever seen, John Anderson, you know? And then there's two little words there, the fine print, that sort of can change the meaning of things just a little bit. And the two words are former deputy. <laughs> and then in massive writing underneath that is Prime Minister of Australia. <laughs> and I thought, wow. <laughs> they must know something I don't. <laughs> so I took a photograph of it. I thought, I'm going to take this back to Canberra and I'm going to go down to the Prime Minister's office down there and say, listen, old chap, don't know whether anybody's told you, but there's been a coup. The only problem was that by the time I got back to Australia, there had been a coup. <laughs> so there you go, a few remarks as I go through. I'm now 10 years out of public life, and I look at it and I think, when I left, I felt free to go. The country seemed to be in a good place. It was just before the great financial crisis. I knew the government was getting a little tired, and the Australian people, understandably, in 07 changed the government, but I didn't even contest it. I decided to go farming. And then we had the great financial crisis, as it's been known. And then I started to notice, and you will have noticed too, that everything was changing, not just in Australia, but right across the Western world. And I think the two are related. What that financial crisis showed us is that we've actually become very selfish. It required enormous effort, not so much in this country, because a certain government had got rid of all the government debt, and we'd paid it off. It was terrible work. I was one of the five that Howard asked in 1996 to be on what was called the Razor Gang and to find the savings to pay all that debt back and try and put some money in the bank, which is now known as the Future Fund, and Peter Costello still chairs it. So this country was relatively unaffected, but every other Western country had a debt crisis and they sold it with more debt. America's debt is beyond imagination. England's debt is beyond imagination. The only country in Europe that has wound its debt back is Germany because of the common currency, and they're able to export their high quality goods at lower prices. Have you noticed how the relative prices between, say, a Toyota uh, and a Volkswagen have evened up? And that's the currency. Normally, a floating currency would see the Deutschmark through the roof, so you'd still pay twice for, for golf what you pay for a Corolla. But because it's now a tied currency, the economists amongst you understand what's happened, those weaker economies, Spain, Italy, Greece, what have you, drag the currency down and make those German exports very cheap. So the poor economies that are in real trouble can't recover. So 50% of young Greeks can't get a job. But the wealthier economies are made even wealthier. It's a terrible arrangement. It's the sort of clumsy things people do when they lack the wisdom and prudence that God would intend we exercise. So. Where have we got to? I think it's shown that we have become unbelievably self-serving and narcissistic. And instead, we've got ourselves caught between this incredible recognition of the individual that the Bible tells us God applies to us. Every one of us matters enormously and are loved beyond all belief. So this incredible thing that this terrible, inadequate, sinful man, John Anderson, is loved uniquely by the king of the universe. But that brings with it an incredible responsibility, which is that there's another Anderson here called Roy. I can't believe this, but he matters as much as I do. <laughs> and <laughs> before God, he's of absolutely equal standing and loved and revered just as I am. So you see the tension? And how wonderful that actually is. Love your neighbour. Do unto him as you would have him do unto you. Because he matters too. Even if I don't like him. I do like you, Roy. But you know what I mean. I have to love you whether I like you or not. That's what the Bible says. And Menzies got it right. When he said, 
Democracy is not a machine, it's a spirit in which the Christian conception that no matter your station in life or who you are, every individual bears the stamp of God. But we see we've rejected that, haven't we? We've walked away from it. Our culture's mocked God out of the public square and with it has gone that fundamental of democracy where we treat our neighbours properly. We don't have to be forced to. We don't have to be told to. Our standards break down, we test the law, we get away with whatever we can because it's all about me. You know, we had the Banking uh, Royal Commission of Inquiry last year. See, our trust in our institutions has broken down because people don't do what they ought to do. Politicians, I hate to say it, great slabs of the church breaks my heart. Um, um, now we've got the aged care being investigated. We had the Royal Commission of Inquiry into the banks. As it turned out, would you agree with me, it's a good thing we had the Royal Commission of Inquiry into the banks? And we've got 78 recommendations to tidy it up. Is that a good thing? Yep. Do you know what? It's terrible that either were needed. Terrible. Freedoms are lost when people don't do what they ought to do. They have to be coerced. They have to be policed. Let me tell you this little story on banking as an illustration of what I'm trying to say. One of the institutions that came out of it really badly was the AMP. Okay? Really disgraced. Their chairman went, their CEO went, half the board went. It's a mess. Although they put a very good person in there now to fix it up. Um, the AMP, the Australian Mutual Providence Society, was started by a Christian minister and some of his Christian business friends. And it became, after the churches, the greatest influence, according to its historian, Geoffrey Blaney, for economic and social good in Australia after the churches. The AMP was completely trusted in an age when there was very little banking regulation. Why? It was set up by honourable men behaving honourably for the benefit of others. Yes, to make money, but to do good things with the making of money. It was trusted in an age when there was almost no regulation because people were doing what they ought to do, the Christian concept. We'll treat our neighbours properly. We'll act out of love. We've switched it on its head. We've reversed it completely. We've said it's all about me. You know, in fact, there is an ad from one of the banks, look after the most important person in the world, you. Well, when you live your life that way, you end up dissatisfied. It doesn't work because we weren't wired for it to be all about me. And society is fractured. So my message, the gospel is real. I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power under salvation for all men. You shouldn't be either. Please don't be. What you're doing here, your organisers and so forth, is fantastic. The second thing I want to say to you is get real about your faith. Learn, pray, lead your families. The third thing I want to say is be salt and light in your fractured, broken community. Because where we've gone to is a dark place. We're falling somewhere between this wonderful recognition of the value of each individual and loving our neighbour to a dreadful place in the middle where it's tribal. And I belong to my little group and we'll look for power at the expense of everybody else. That is what the Australian people in their wisdom actually rejected, I believe, a couple of weeks ago. I think John Howard had it right. I'm not here to be party political. And there are many Labor leaders, leaders and so forth that I've been friends with, uh, what have you. But that particular Labor leader kept trying to divide Australians. And I think Australians rejected it. John Howard said something, and I, I don't always agree with John, but he said this, you might have heard it. We inherited a lot of good things from the British, their parliaments, legal systems and so forth, but we didn't inherit their terrible class system and we don't want to start now. The setting of one Australian against another. But that's what we've come to, we've got tribal. We need to reject that outright. We need to love and serve one another openly and honestly. Your country needs you, fellas. Be the leaders in your situation that you are wired and equipped to be. God bless you. Happy to take a couple of questions.